thank you so much. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful. Okay, uh, welcome uh, to building and deploying a Gen AI, Gen AI app in 20 minutes. I'm really happy that uh, you could all be here today, and I hope that there's some exciting stuff uh, to show you. So, what we're gonna be talking about today, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit first, just get right into it, talk about the architecture and do a demo of the app itself, start with the exciting stuff, uh, talk a little bit about ML Run, which is the tool we're gonna be using for the containerization, the deployment, the tracking, the monitoring, all that fun stuff. Talk a little bit about RAG versus fine tuning um, and why we're gonna be using both in this application. And then we're gonna do a deep dive on each of the components, talk a little bit about the data pipelines, the training pipeline, the application pipeline, and then uh, show you a little bit about the, uh, the front end. If we have time, I wanna do some Q&A at the end. I um, ask that you please hold any questions until then. If you don't have time, feel free to come and uh, talk to me after the session or uh, talk to us at the Iguazio booth. It's big and green, you really can't say. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I am a senior machine learning engineer at Iguazio who has since been acquired by McKinsey. Um, and uh, there's some stuff there that I'm really not gonna read, um, but I'm very excited to be here and uh, excited that you are too. So let's get into the fun stuff. Uh, let's talk first about the architecture of the app that we're building. So it's gonna look a little something like this. So we are building a fine-tuned chatbot with RAG enrichment. At the end of the day, what we will have is a bot so that we can learn about ML ops from a pirate. Um, kind of fun, kind of halloween -y. But basically we're gonna be fine-tuning the style of the bot um, we're going to be fine-tuning the Llama 7B model uh, to speak like a pilot, and then we're going to enrich the responses with um, uh, data from a vector database, uh, which comes from data on uh, MLOps blogs and things about MLOps. Uh, so we'll be able to ask it questions about MLOps, and it's going to respond to us uh, like a pilot. So there's a few different pieces. Uh, there are the data pipelines. So we have the fine-tuning uh, data itself, and we also have the blog data that we're using for the RAG enrichment. Uh, we have the uh, fine-tuning pipeline where we're going to be using the QR to fine-tune, again, the uh, Hug and Face 7B base model. Uh, we have the real-time application pipeline, and this is doing most of the heavy lifting at, uh, at different time, where we're like, painting the requests, uh, doing the RAG enrichment, format of the prompt in the format our model expects, uh, inferencing the online, and then returning the response back to the user. And then we have a very simple front end uh, where we'll be able you know, to talk to it and uh, change some parameters and all that. So, what it's gonna look like in practice is something like this. Uh, it's very hard to read that text, so we're gonna go ahead and hop into the, uh, the actual application here in just a moment. And then, one of the interesting things about this is, right, the thing that the user sees is only this front end. A lot of the exciting, engineering, interesting stuff is happening behind the scenes. So that's really not something we're gonna be able to see in the application itself. So I did also wanna show a little bit about the experiment tracking and the pipeline orchestration itself. Um, with more emphasis on what is going inside the pipeline. So, let's go ahead and let's talk to the pipeline. So we have an application here. Let me know if this is big enough for everyone. Uh, so we have you know, a number of parameters over here on the left-hand side to you know, change the generation. We have this adapter. So I have two adapters. One is pirate and one is regular. I'll go into what this is in a little bit. But basically these are two fine-tuned models and there's adapters that are put onto the uh, Llama 7B base model and I can switch between them uh, without having to reload the whole model itself, which is kind of nice. And then I also have this rag enrichment here. So let's just go ahead and ask the question. Um, can ML Run work with Spark? If it's not the fastest, you could probably spend a little bit more time on you know, fine-tuning and optimizing and things like that. Uh, but we should get a response back from the model. And uh, indeed, it sounds kind of pirate. So I, am all right, can work for Spark. The Spark operator runtime provides blah, 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 blah. Right, so kind of priority, but the actual information uh, from the response itself is coming from these sources, uh, which if you know, I go ahead and open these guys, um, this is one about the Spark operator, so this is about Spark. And this guy here is uh, about a Guazio release, but if I look for Spark, Spark operator is in there. So it pulled information from the vector database, which is coming from those blogs, and enriched the response using that. Uh, we can go ahead and ask another question. Uh, what is model monitoring? So monitoring, right? Monitoring. Um, and again, it's going to search, uh, find relevant articles, inject that into the prompt, and then we should get a response that sounds vaguely pirated. So model monitoring would be the process of overseeing the operation and blah, 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 blah. Right? Um, so this here, it kind of shows, right? So one, we have the style of, of, the, of the bot speaking in a certain way. Um, and we can go ahead and actually switch this 
over to the regular adapter to see what the quote unquote normal version would be. So, uh, what is model monitoring? Ask us a question. And uh, we should go through this more spec that is in a little bit more plain English. And it even is. So, model monitoring is a process, blah, 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 blah. So, we can see here that. Um, it's responding in different ways. We're able to affect which adapter we're using, right, to speak in a certain style, and we'll talk about why you might want to do that. Could you do this with prompting to speak like a pirate? Yes. Uh, let's just pretend this is super secret proprietary pirate speak that only my company has, so I want to fine tune my particular version of pirate. This could also be your own marketing copy or your own voice of your brand, right, something that you really can't do with prompting. Um, another interesting thing that is kind of a side effect of the way that I pre-process the data um, is if I ask, um, so I'm going to ask, uh, can Emma run work with Spark? Um, and it's going to respond and it's going to have um, uppercase and capitals and things like that in this regular adapter. So we can see here that Emma run is capitalized, Spark is capitalized, things like that. So jump over to Pirate and ask the same question. Can Emma run work with Spark? The library that I'm using to translate into the quote unquote pirate speak as a side effect, it turned everything lowercase. And so you'll notice that in the response, everything here is lowercase as well, so it's just another artifact of the style that the model has learned uh, based on that fine tuning. So that's kind of the application. I did also want to briefly show the uh, pipeline itself. So this is the ingestion and the uh, fine tuning pipeline. So each one of these is its own component that runs in a container with its own runtime resources, et cetera, et cetera, on Kubernetes. Um, this guy uh, takes in a list of URLs. We'll, we'll talk about how we're actually doing it behind the scenes. Uh, this guy is getting the uh, Dolly data set, the Databricks 16K data set. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but we can see that the outputs include the regular and the pirate version. And in fact, if we take a look at this and just see, so the name of the third daughter is Alice, and I take a look at the pirate version. Uh, we should be able to see the same thing, the name of the third daughter be Alice. So a little bit more pirate. And then we have uh, fine tune for each one again is running at its own runtime uh, where we're fine tuning a Llama uh, 7B base model based on the uh, regular data set and the pirate data set. So that's pretty much what we're doing and then we'll talk a little bit about the serving the application and a little bit. All right, so that brings us back to here. Wanted to briefly talk about MR Run, which is the tool that we're using for the orchestration itself and that the pipeline that we saw and all that is, is um, part of MR Run. So MRUN, there's a lot in this slide, but long story short, MRUN is an MLOps orchestration framework, 100% uh, open source, that's used to build, deploy, and manage ML solutions across your lifestyle. Um, if you think about some of the challenges that you may run into, say data science teams all the way over here, you got the ops team all the way over here, you know, separate teams, they may be using different tools, uh, you know, you train a model, all right guys, the model's trained, throw it over the wall, make it work in production, all right, it's not really a scalable, approach to be able to track things long term and be able to quickly iterate on things. So MRUN is, is a way to make that a little bit more automated, fast and continuous, so you're using the same tool throughout development and production. Um, MRUN is a, it's a client server architecture, so the server is going to be running on your Kubernetes cluster, which is where you're actually going to need to compute, and then the client could be installed on your laptop or your Jupyter notebook or CI CD or what have you. And then you can just submit jobs to run remotely on the cluster. Um, there's some more information on the capabilities here on like, you know, experiment tracking and pipeline automation and deployment and monitoring and all this kind of stuff. Um, I'll make sure that these slides are available to you all so you guys can uh, look, at, look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, but what I did want to spend a moment on is this guy right here, uh, which is the concept of an ML run function. And this is basically, right, I write my code and I have my, uh, you know, my frameworks and packages and what have you, whatever I need to do uh, for my code. That's, you know, very, very uh, flex flexible. Um, then there's this element of standardization that MRUN basically say, hey, I want to run this script or this model with this Docker image, two CPUs and a GPU, this node group, uh, and it knows how to package it all up and knows how to deploy it on a cluster on Kubernetes and switch between different runtimes like job, Spark, model serving, et cetera, et cetera. Then you pass stuff in, your code does whatever it does, and then it logs things. Um, we actually saw a little bit about that. So we saw like the data set that was logged and, and the pipeline. So that's just a little bit about MLRun. Um, that's the tool that we're using for this deployment, which makes it really easy to um, quickly iterate and deploy things at scale. Um, but the concepts we'll be talking about are not MLRun specific, and you can use this with just about any tech stack. Okay, so I did want to take a quick detour and talk a little bit about RAG versus fine tuning, um, which we're using both in this application. I wanted to talk about why we're using each. 
So there's some really great diagrams from an excellent article called Rag versus Fine Tuning, which is the best tool to use to our LLM application. Uh, they go into a lot more detail than I'm able to here. But basically, they talk about kind of the two main approaches. Um, so let's, let's take it one by one. So RAP, really good when external knowledge is required. You're looking to minimize hallucinations, right? The data is dynamic, it's changing over time, and also interpretability may be required. Like the model got the data from this source and this is where, right, it got the information from the response. Uh, fine tuning is really good when you want to change the behavior of the model itself. Like maybe you're changing the behavior or the style or the vocabulary or maybe the output format. Um, the, the larger um, open AI models like uh, GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 are really good at responding consistently in a certain format. Like you say, hey, respond to me in JSON. Some of the smaller open source models are not. So that could also be a good way to make sure that your models are responding in the format that, that you want. Uh, so another, also another thing that uh, <coughs> fine tuning might be good for is reducing the number of tokens that you need uh, so that you're not providing right in context examples, so the model just inherently knows a little bit more about the information, so you're spending fewer tokens and therefore less money, and also generates a little bit more quickly. So if we take a look on the right-hand side, uh, we have a graph of uh, two axes. One is the amount of external knowledge required, and one is the amount of model adaptation required, right, like the style, the behavior, et cetera. So if we take a look here, uh, Q&A system is really high in the external knowledge required and a little bit low on the model adaptation, right? It's just you're looking things up and you're responding based on external knowledge. It's a really good candidate for RAG. Fine tuning on the other hand here is a summarization example. So summarization might be a good use case for fine tuning because you're not looking up external data, right? You're providing it the data that you want it to summarize, but maybe you want it to be summarized in a certain format or a certain style or using a certain vocabulary. So that might be a good candidate for that. Up here we have a hybrid approach. So the example listed here is customer support automation where you might need the style of your brand or your customer service representatives or you know, respond in a certain polite tone, right? So the, the way that the model responds in the style uh, comes from the fine tuning, but you may also need additional information like uh, information from your knowledge base or information on the customer or things like that that you would need from a RAC system. So there definitely is a place where both uh, are required and that's what we're gonna be showing today, where the fine tuning again is making a topic to pirate and the RAC is on the ML as well. So, let's go ahead and take a deep dive on each of the individual components. We're gonna start with the data pipelines, we're gonna uh, go into the fine tuning, and then go into the application pipeline itself, uh, and talk a little bit more about what's going on under the hood. Again, the, the, front, end, the, excuse me, the front end is, is nice, it's a good way to interact, but a lot of the fun engineering stuff is really not something that's visible from the front end. So, let's talk about the fine tuning data set. Um, that's not coming up, is it? Uh, okay, so let's talk about that. What we are using is the Databricks Dolly 15, 15K dataset. Really great open source data set. It's uh, created by Databricks employees. Could you go uh, back a bit? They were given a Then go back a slide back. I just wanted to like, sort of find it. And it, I will be providing all the slides to make sure they're available. Thank you. Um, so the Databricks 15K dataset, uh, basically Databricks employees were provided a few different categories like summarization, Q&A, classification, right, things like that, and they came up with an instruction response pair in an optional context, context being additional information you would need to answer the question. Uh, and so essentially, we're gonna be turning that into a particular format, um, and then we're gonna be fine tuning our model with that particular instruction format. Uh, I wanna note we're not using the, uh, the chat variant of the Llama 7B model, because that's already been fine tuned with a particular style. Uh, if you've used it before, you know there's like the INST in brackets to provide the instruction, and then that's like the system prompt and things like that. So it's already been fine-tuned on a certain instruction format. We're gonna be providing our own, so we're giving it the base model. It may also be possible to use the chat model, but uh, that might re require some more experimentation. So the format's gonna be something like this. Uh, so we're gonna have at the beginning, so below is an instruction that describes a task, write a response that appropriately completes the request. Uh, and then we have the instruction. Uh, this is like the, right, from the instruction column, and then we have the response, which is from the response column. And then again, if we have the optional context, it's gonna be here, that's this little input part, and this is still really part of the instruction. So we're gonna go ahead and process all the elements in that data set to conform to this particular instruction format. And at inference time, when we go ahead and we ask the model a question, we're gonna be formatting in the exact same way, right? So we're gonna be providing this beginning piece. What we ask the bot is gonna be part of this instruction. If we're doing the RAG enrichment, it's gonna be part of this input. And we're gonna stop it right here at the beginning of response or excuse me, at the end of response, because that's where we want the model to take over and start generating stuff. So that's how we're gonna be, uh, it, uh, excuse me, formatting the instructions. 
And then the last piece here is the English to Pirate translation. So there truly is a Python library for everything. I found one called R, A-R-R-R. -R -R. And uh, basically, you give it regular English, and it translates it to Pirate speak. Um, kind of funny, kind of kind of interesting, but it really does show that the, the style is changing. You'll also notice, uh, so I put in here the abstract for this talk, um, and this is the Pirate output. You'll notice that there are capitals here, for example, AI, AI, Gen AI. All of these are lowercase. We actually saw this was part of the generation as well, that everything from the pirate adapter was lowercase. So it learned that as well, and that was part of the style that it learned. It was unintentional, but it's also a good showcase of how it's picking up the style that it learned. Okay, so that is the fine-tuning data. That brings us now to the MLOps blog data for the RAG enrichment. So this is something that's a little bit more well-studied. I feel like there's a lot of blogs and articles and talks on RAG systems, so I'm not gonna go too, too much into details on exactly how it works. I'm gonna provide you with some code snippets on how I did it with Wenchin, and you guys can kind of take that and extrapolate. <laughs> so, first things first, uh, we have a list of URLs, and again, these are, I'm not sure if you can read that up there, but these are links to the Aguasio blogs on MLOps, MLRun, Aguasio, all, all things like that, but basically it's just right, a series of URLs. From there, we are scraping the articles as documents. We're using the unstructured URL loader from Wenchin. Basically, give it a list of URLs, um, give it that header, or else it's, uh, it's gonna yell at you. And then you say, load or not load. Super, super easy, and it's doing a lot of heavy lifting for you. From there, we have a list of documents, which has all the text from the article, as well as the source, which is the URL. Now we're gonna split it into chunks. Uh, there's a lot more you can do here, and this is gonna require some refinement. Basically, we're splitting the larger document into smaller chunks so that you can more easily find things. Um, some parameters you're gonna wanna play with is the chunk size and the chunk overlap. If the chunks are too large, you're gonna have a lot of noise in what you retrieve. If the chunks are too small, they're not gonna have enough context to really get the information you need. So you're gonna to need to really play with that, and how you process one type of data may be different from how you process another type of data. But at this point, we have a list of doc uh, document chunks, which has the content and also the source. And then we're gonna embed and ingest into the vector store. Uh, so there's a lot going on in these two lines of code. So one is we are using hugging face embeddings. Um, and I'm using one particular embeddings model, but again, it's hugging face, so you can swap it out super, super easily. There's a lot of uh, great embeddings models out there. And then we are initializing the Milvis vector store. Again, it could be a different vector store. I happen to be using Milvis where we pass in the embeddings function and also the connection arguments. Um, this one happens to be running on the same Kubernetes cluster that I'm running in, so I just have like a local uh, Kubernetes URL. Uh, and then we say store.addDocuments. It will go ahead, it will uh, embed the documents using the embeddings model we define, and then ingest it into the vector store. Uh, so a lot happening there. And then we can go ahead and search. And this is a very naive way to uh, search, but basically I'm saying store.similarity search give it a query and give it a value k, which is the number of relevant documents or chunks, and it will return to you a list of right, things that came up. There's a lot more you can do here. Um, for example, one thing is a parent document retriever, where instead of just retrieving one chunk, you can retrieve the entire parent document for a given chunk. Uh, there's lots of other ways that you can improve this, but this is a pretty simple approach that seems to work for this application. So that's on the right. That brings us now to the QR fine tuning. Uh, which is probably the more interesting part of this. I think it's a little bit less studied and there's fewer examples of it out there. And this probably took me the longest to build out. So uh, let's talk about it. So QR is quantized LLMs with low rank adapters. Um, you would need someone smarter than myself to explain the theory and the math behind it. Uh, but there's a really good quote from this article, QLORA fine tuning a large language model from a GPU. LORA adds a tiny amount of trainable parameters, i.e. adapters for each layer of the LLM and freezes all the original parameters. For fine tuning, we only have to update the adapter weights, which significantly reduces the memory footprint. Uh, we actually have this um, diagram from the original LoRa paper here, where we can see that um, instead of uh, fine tuning the entire pre trained weights, you only have to fine tune these smaller matrices. So, if we take a look at this standard approach, right, so we have the model loaded in, in 16 bit. If we wanted to fine tune this, we're updating everything in the model. So, it's going to take quite a bit of memory to first load the model and a lot of compute to uh, fine tune it. Then LoRa comes along, and LoRa is what's described here, which is these adapters, right? We have a small adapter matrix, which is the only thing we're updating. We're not updating the entire model, and so we're able to create these adapters. And in our example, we saw we had a regular adapter, and we had a pirate adapter. Um, so those are the things that I was fine-tuning, and it was very, very quick to fine-tune. And then you basically slap that on the end of the model, and you're able to, um, to, to fine-tune quite quickly with uh, fewer compute resources. 
Then Kubler comes along and we're able to actually quantize the model before we start fine tuning it. So we can fit these large LLMs into very, very small compute footprints. I actually have the Llama 7B model running at home on a 1080 Ti, which is like a consumer grade GPU from five years ago. Right? So you can really squeeze down the amount of compute that you need. So now we're able to fine tune, we're able to fit the model into a very small uh, compute footprint, memory footprint. And then we're able to fine tune it very quickly because we're only updating a small amount of the, of the weight. So that's kind of the idea behind the QR. So again, I'm going to go through some of the uh, examples, or excuse me, some of the code snippets that I did uh, for this. So if you've used Hugging Face before, these first two steps are going to look pretty similar. So we have the tokenizer and then we also load in the model. Um, so this is using the auto tokenizer and the auto model for causal LM. And this is pretty, pretty standard Hugging Face stuff. Uh, the piece that's in the middle is the model quantization, and this puts the Q in QR. So this is, we're specifying the quantization configuration uh, under the hood, it's using a library called bits and bytes, um, which is really great, but I originally intended to do this whole talk on my laptop, and I have an M2 Mac with the Apple Silicon chip. Basically, if you're not using an NVIDIA GPU, good luck. <laughs> so I ended up migrating to the cloud. So anyways, bits and bytes, you're specifying here, I'm loading in a 4-bit, I'm actually uh, doing double quantization, so it's taking the quantized model and then quantizing it again, so you get a little bit more memory savings. And then you load the model with that quantization. Here's where you specify the LoRa config, and this is, again, uh, we're pointing to the modules that we're wanting to fine tune. In this case, it's all the linear layers from the model, and specifying some hyperparameters. For example, R here is the rank of the, of the adapter matrix. And these are more hyperparameters you're gonna wanna play with, um, that right, uh, machine learning is all about experimentation. So more uh, hyperparameters you can go ahead and play around with. Go find your trainer. This is a hugging face trainer. Basically you put a bunch of arguments in here and you're able to feed it into the trainer very easily. Um, and then finally we have this guy here, which is a supervised fine tuning trainer. And this is a lightweight wrapper on top of the regular hugging face trainer. It just makes it a little bit more easy and convenient to do things like uh, this particular task and, and fine tune models. So plugging in the model, plugging in the data set, plugging in the pep config, which is our lower configuration over here, tokenize your training arguments, and then trainer.train. That's pretty much it. So very, very, very easy to go ahead and get this thing up and running. And the last thing, that brings us to the application pipeline itself. So we have all the pieces, right? Uh, we are able to, we have our data set, both from the fine tuning and the rag enrichment. We've fine tuned our model, but now we want to put this thing into a real application and be able to serve. So again, we're gonna to need to handle the requests, do the enrichment, uh, format with the prompt, inference with the LLM, and then send a response back. So this is where I'm using MLM, um, and essentially, first thing I do is define some source code. So there is a preprocessing function, which takes in a dictionary, basically just a JSON event, and it is doing two things. One, it is uh, querying, the L excuse me, querying the vector store, if we're specifying the, you know, the rack parameter, and it's going to then find those chunks using that, essentially that code snippet that we saw before, and then it's going to return those chunks back, and then it's gonna format the prompt, and it's gonna format it in the same way that we saw at the beginning, where it has that header, and then it has instruction, we put in our text, we have the input, that's the stuff in the rag, and then we have response, and that's where it stops, and that's where our model starts generating. So it's gonna do the, the enrichment, and it's gonna format the prompt, and then we have the LLM model server, and this is using an MLM abstraction uh, called the V2 model server, Basically what you do is you define uh, how do I load the model and how do I predict the model. Uh, all the other stuff is handled uh, for you in terms of routing and loading and all that fun stuff. Basically in load, I am right, I'm loading the model, I'm loading the adapter, I'm loading the tokenizer, all that kind of stuff. And then in predict, I am right, taking in the prompt, the formatted prompt, so just basically text, putting it into the LLM and then returning the response back. So that's like the, the underlying source code. And then I'm using MRN to do some of the orchestration and deep learning. So, Kind of hard to see there. Um, I wonder if I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I can. Great. Nice. Um, so basically, first thing I'm doing is saying uh, project.set function. This creates one of those ML run function abstractions that we were talking about earlier that makes it very easy to deploy something on a cluster. You say, hey, I want to run this serving.py code, which contains our preprocessing and contains the LLM model server. Run it as a serving function. This could also be job, it could be Spark, it could be Dask, right? We're doing the model server and with, it, with this Docker image. Oh, and by the way, I need the rest of the Git repo too, so go ahead and pull that as well. Then you can customize a little bit. I can set environment variables, uh, set node selectors, so you can define which pools of resources in your Kubernetes cluster you want this to run on. 
Uh, and then also do things like add a GPU. Uh, I had to increase the readiness timeout because it takes a long time to pull these models and load them into memory. And then I essentially disabled auto scaling. Uh, this framework supports auto scaling, um, but I didn't want that. So I basically set the min and max number of replicas to one. And then I went ahead and defined the topology of the graph. Um, so basically I can say, hey, I want to run this piece, and then I want to run this piece, and this goes to this, and this goes to this, and these are the inputs, and these are the outputs. Uh, and at the end of the day, we get a graph that looks something like this. So I'm basically pointing to the pre-processing code, pointing to the LLM model serving code, and then I have the initialization, initialization arguments for the LLM model server, and then I have this guy here. And then to deploy it, I say project.deploy function. So if we think about the serving function, it contains, contains the source code, contains the Docker image, it contains the resource customizations, it contains how the source code is being routed, and it also contains the initialization arguments for that source code. So everything we need to put this thing into production is essentially in this object, which I can save and export and reuse, or I can just run it and say project at the play function. And that's pretty much it. So it looks like we wrapped up a little bit early. So it looks like we have a few minutes for Q&A. Before I uh, roll over to that, I did want to note that if you want to chat a little bit more, we are at the 